In an island wilderness, a hike through paradise turns into disaster. An horrific accident leaves a man's life resting in the hands of someone he barely knows. See you soon. Days from help in the middle of a treacherous rainforest, the next 48 hours will change both their lives forever. It'll be the ultimate test of character, compassion, and the will to survive. I'd always said that there's some kind of glamour, if you like, in you know, dying in a place that you love. And now I'm staring down the barrel of that, and it doesn't look that pretty. Hitchinbrook Island, at the northern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. 40,000 hectares of dense tropical rainforest surrounding formidable rocky peaks. A protected wilderness, there are no roads and no inhabitants. It's exactly the sort of place that Warren MacDonald lives to explore. A seasoned hiker who spent time as an environmental activist protecting endangered habitats He's trekked some of the world's most extreme landscapes. I've been hearing a lot over the years about Hinchinbrook Island and, and figured being so close, you know, I should go and check it out. But it always been on my map. Hinchinbrook is renowned in the hiking community as one of Australia's best kept secrets. Accessible only by a single ferry that makes the crossing once a day. You know, when I go hiking, I don't go hiking usually to be with the crowd, so I took off on my own. It was a big sense of freedom, I suppose. I think the isolation is always a huge part of it for me. You know, I'm always out to, to try and get to those places where not everybody goes to. There are rarely more than a handful of hikers on Hitchinbrook, scattered along the island's only established trail. Geert van Hulen is a photographer and painter. He's travelled from his native Holland to walk the trails and paint the landscape of Hitchinbrook. I really like the physical exercise because I start not very well trained and basically walk myself fit. Hiking to me is one of the things I really basically live for and also being able to sketch and paint and draw is very important to me. The opportunity that I got for that on Hinchinbrook was just awesome, fantastic. Eventually got towards the end of the day and uh, got to Little Zoe Bay and first thing I noticed is there's a guy sitting down on the beach wearing a bandana basically, sketching the scene out on the ocean. And I remember thinking, wow, that guy looks pretty chilled out. Hey, how are you going? Hey. I'm uh, Geert van Keulen from Holland. Or McDonald's. Hey, good to meet you. Good to see. Straight away there was a connection. It's a beautiful place, you know, I have some friends, uh, got some friends in Townsville. They was uh, talking about, uh, uh, about the Innsbruck, you know? Yeah. What do you got there? It's uh, the trail notes. Some trail notes for uh, Mount Bowen. I was thinking uh, to climb it, you know. All right, take a look. Yeah, yeah, take a look. You know that uh, the, there's that book, A Thousand Things to Do Before You Die? Oh, yeah. It, uh, apparently the view from the top of, uh, of Mount Bowen is uh, in there twice. How long, how long do you reckon it would take to climb? If you're interested, then uh, we, can, uh, we can climb it together. I mean. So we made a plan to get an early start in the morning. We started walking out of the campsite and, uh, well, not much was said between the two of us. 
I straight away noticed that this is a guy who doesn't really dwell on about stuff. Let's get on with the job. That was the type of guy that Warren was. We figured it would probably take eight hours to get to a high camp and from there the next day we'd be able to make the summit and probably come all the way back down to the beach in that day. Mount Bowen is covered in almost impenetrable rainforest, but from its peak to its base run creek beds that cut through the dense undergrowth. Now, one of the things you come across in Queensland is this, this vine called lawyer vine. Pretty aptly named. When this stuff gets hold of you, it's not too keen to let you go. So we tried to spend as much time as we could in that creek bed. Geert and Warren plan to follow the creek to the mountain summit. We got to the point where we were basically hopping from boulder to boulder. And every time I saw Warren, without any effort, basically sort of tiptoeing almost over the rocks in front of me, that I had a real battle of getting on with. I don't know where I got it from, but I've got a pack on for the first time in six months and I'm bouncing like a gazelle from rock to rock. I remember thinking, what if I started here, you know? I mean, this is not a joke, this is serious walking. Jeez, you all right, Gid? You all right? Yeah, no, fine, fine. Take the camera, take the camera. You got it? Your legs all right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, stupid. It came obvious to me that he was just fitter than I was. But at the same time, I was having a great time. And I like that sort of element in hiking very much. Why should it be easy? I might as well stay home. We'd probably been going for five hours or so when I started thinking, wow, you know, we don't look like we're anywhere near where we need to be. What do you reckon? I reckon we're in the wrong creek, bed. I reckon you're right. I definitely, I didn't feel like we were lost. I don't even know if I'd use the term geographically embarrassed. I just, for, to me, it wasn't a huge deal. We're gonna lose the light, you know, soon. It's gonna get dark. We can't exactly camp here. Come on, get. Come on, get. We kept on going up and up going from one boulder to the other. And as it just goes in the tropics, the dark sets in really quickly. And before you know it, you need a torch just to, to, to find your bearings. We realized we couldn't go any further. I was just glad to have stopped. And I think Warren was as well. And that's why we made our camp and we had tea. So I need to take a leak. And the last thing that I want to do is do it in the creek. You remember, we're, we're out there hiking. This is our drinking water. So the rule is you want to get at least 50 metres away from the creek. So I decided that I'd climb up this embankment and I you know, made my way across the creek, feeling my way with my feet, and got to the wall on the other side. And got my foot up onto the rock. And at that point, I heard a huge crack. I didn't have a clue what had happened. Not a clue. Juan, you all right? What? and I saw a complete surrealistic scene. 
was a human being and this huge rock was on top of him. At this point, it's, it's totally all about the, the pain grinding down into my legs and I need to, to make it stop. In a freak accident, Warren McDonald is pinned under a chunk of granite weighing more than a ton. He has no idea how badly he's injured, only that he's trapped. So we, we just keep pushing at this thing for a couple of minutes. It's incredible the negative energy that the rock actually gave. It was almost as though the rock was pushing me back. Nothing happened and it's like uh, trying to push a tank out of the way. I'm in a world of pain, but there's not a hell of a lot I can do about it. At some point, something kicks in and I would almost describe it as some kind of primeval survival tactic. And at this point, I start directing gear. Oh, my God. Just stay calm. All we need to do, we need to build a lever. We've got to find a branch. There's something we need to get a, a big branch. A little bit. Follow me as quick as I can. Go quickly, gear. So it started raining. I'm thinking, this is an idea. We don't really need this. The last thing we need right now is rain. I can hear him downstream wrestling with, with trees and branches of trees trying to break off something decent that we can use as a, a lever. And I, I can almost picture in my mind what he's doing. And obviously, I want him to come back as, as quick as he can. You know, I'm almost trying to will him to hurry up. Uh, you be OK, man. I think I got it, I got it. I'm coming, boy. I'm coming, coming, man. So Gets beside me pushing. I'm pushing so hard now that I feel like I'm, I'm going to tear myself in half. And then all of a sudden it, it moves, maybe an inch. Do you know all it really did is we helped it settle further onto me. Get it tight. We need a bigger branch. We need a tree. Yeah. We gotta get a tree. Okay. Get a good one. You're gonna be alright, mate. <laughs> when he leaves, I start thinking about how I'm going to get down. I envisage crawling back down this creek bed and how long that's going to take me. I'm pretty sure that I got two pretty badly broken legs. No, I'm not looking forward to it. I've been given a Swiss Army knife by someone. And with the Swiss Army knife, I decided to uh, start cutting the wood and sawing, as it were. And in the process of doing that, the handles of the Swiss Army knives, I, I pushed them off and did not realize that the metal bits that kept the handles together had gone into my skin and tore the whole inside of my hand open. 
didn't even feel it. You know, you don't feel pain, but... The rain's getting harder and harder. You know, it's getting louder and louder. And this realisation hits me that I'm sitting in a creek bed and the water is starting to rise. It's not going to take too long at this rate for it to go over my head. Okay, man. I got a good one. Where, where shall I put it? Uh, okay, I'll make out here. Uh, one. One. Two. Three. I think we're both waiting for that miracle of the old lady that lifts the car up, you know, off somebody trapped under a car, and I think we're both hoping for that, and it's it's just not coming. God, come on, kid! God! Hearing that tree crack, it almost stopped me in, in my tracks. At this point now, I, I know that I'm in some serious trouble. That was a really bitter moment. I remember just looking into his eyes and he looking into my eyes and uh, you don't say, say a thing because that's the facts, you know. We had just broken what would probably be the strongest lever we're going to find out here in a creek bed. And it had just cracked like that. And at that point, the, the fear factor has definitely increased for me. I, I, I had this incredible image which will never leave me. I looked uh, in the rain and I saw his silhouette. I saw the silhouette. And the silhouette got exaggerated by uh, the hood of the Gore-Tex jacket that he was wearing. And I could see that his head was to, to one side. I think I think that I heard him moan and I think that I heard him cry. That's the that's the that's the, that's the only time that I think that I heard any complaint. both totally exhausted and it kind of snuck up on me that the rain had backed off. Finally a bit of luck. Oh, we got lots of luck. It's just all bad. I hope it's gonna be okay. What do you think? I think I'd rather be in my sleeping bag. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have to be sorry about anything, mate. You did good. You did really good. I sat next to him and I put my arm around his shoulder and, um, and just comforted him. And he didn't say much. He just sat there. All along, I think, both of us held out this hope that we were going to be able to do something, that something was going to work. Up until that point, 
nobody wants to even contemplate the idea of him hiking out and leaving me alone. You've got a long journey in front of you, mate. You're going to have to go fast. So down and rescue? Yeah. It was impossible to hike out. At that stage, I would have killed myself straight away, I think. So I had to wait until the morning. It's been more than 10 hours since the boulder fell on Warren. The torrential rain has flooded every creek. Gert's only choice if he's to get help is to find a route through the treacherous rainforest they put so much effort into avoiding on the way up. I had spent my whole life being self-sufficient. All of a sudden, I'm in a position where I'm totally reliant on this guy that I've met the day before. As I was looking around, I got a little bit scared because it looked really mean and spooky. And it was, it was a very macabre setting. He looked pretty bad at this stage. He looked incredibly white, pale. If you something to do. I borrowed your socks. Mine got washed away in the night. You go easy, mate. It's gonna be another night, you know, before I make it back to the ferry. I can do that. Another night I can do. I'm not consciously aware of it, but I might even have ignored eye contact for a few seconds there. He'd never looked around. It, it, it seemed like he was just looking in front of him all the time. Maybe he was already preparing himself for what was going to happen next. That he was going to be on his own. I'll see you soon. I had pretty mixed emotions watching Git walk away. I feel more anxious than anything else. He's my only hope. Git! I'm okay! I'm okay! I'm good! I'm okay! I realised this must freak Warren out from here to no end. And he thought, that's, that's some guy who's going to get me out of here. OK, if it gets slippery, just crawl. Just get down there, mate. OK? 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 Everything is wet and high and the incredible, enormous amount of vegetation. Leaves, plants, creepers, plants with edges that can cut your neck in two pieces. You, you go through it. Said that you know, it, uh, you know that there's some kind of uh, some kind of glamour, if you like, in you know dying out in the bush, you know, in a place that you love. And now I'm staring down the barrel of that, and it doesn't look that that pretty. Don't relax. Keep sharp. Keep focused. <laughs> Ah! <sighs> 
Sometimes I'd hurried it a bit too much. <laughs> And went down way too quick. And I, I'm really angry with myself. I think, stupid bastard, you know, calm down, take it easy. Warren is not serviced by someone who goes down like an idiot and kills himself. Just get down in one piece. That's important. I found myself riding a roller coaster, is the best way to describe it, where at times I, I had to psych myself to such a point, it's just like, I'm, gonna, I'm getting through this. You know, I can do it. I'm coming out the other side to taking this nosedive down into the depths of despair in that that's it. This is it. They're going to find you dead out here in a couple of days. And I found that I, I, that I rode that. I hit a nest of tree ants. Green, as green as a lime. And all the all the ants came out and, and were all over me within a few seconds. I was covered in ants. And I saw a pool. And I just jumped in it with, with pack and all. Green ants are just one of the hundreds of biting insects and stinging plants found in the Australian rainforest. It is in fact home to six of the world's most deadly animals, including spiders, crocodiles, scorpions and venomous snakes. Some of the best times in my life had been spent in the wilderness and I'd spent time as an environmentalist protecting wild places and the irony was that that same kind of place was now going to be the end of me. I found myself wanting to pick up the, the notebook that Geert had left and, and to start writing a few things down. And I didn't realise it at first, but then it dawned on me that, in a sense, I was writing my last words and wanting to record that for family and, and, and people that I love. And then I realised why Geert had, had left it there with me. I kept on descending, falling down, slipping, sliding. I had to get down in one piece, and that was what I was concentrating on. And um, at about six o'clock, a new rain shower started. Once again, it rained like an idiot. And where I thought Warren was, it was dark, black cloud. I'd been hallucinating. I felt nauseous. Couldn't keep anything down. It was probably hypothermic. And starting to feel sick like that was really a sign to me that I probably wouldn't last that much longer. Anybody? 
I didn't feel any anger towards that. I think I felt a sense of despair, if you like, that there wasn't anything else I could do, that it was all over. I didn't really know what that meant, but I didn't like it. I don't know about uh, reincarnation and life after death and all the rest of it. Nobody has yet to convince me that, uh, that, that this isn't it. I hadn't slept well, uh, I hardly had slept, and at about three or four in the morning I started walking. I was extremely tired, and I started to lose it. And I lost the willpower to, to lift my feet up properly. Just didn't want, didn't want to walk anymore, I had enough. I couldn't care if I'd, uh, there were a few moments there that I couldn't have cared if I just dropped there and fall asleep. What the hell are you doing up here anyway in the first place? I looked down and saw worn socks. Purple explorers, never forget it. I, I looked at them and I th that reminded me of him being trapped up there. And it's kept me in focus. So it must be mid-morning that I notice in the pool of water around my right foot that there's this red cloud. And I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell's all that about? You know, it's a little late to, to start bleeding now. And I'm wondering what to make of it when I notice something moving in the water. and realised with horror that it's a yabby, a freshwater crayfish. As if things hadn't been bizarre enough up to this point, this guy's nipping away at my foot. And I, I feel like now like I'm living in some kind of horror movie. But I grabbed a branch from behind me and just started spearing it, trying to take this guy out. God, get up. What made it even worse was that I couldn't feel anything. And that he could have been there for hours. He could have been there all day. It's been 35 hours since the boulder fell on Warren. Many miles away, Geert has reached the base of Mount Bowen, but he's been forced off course. He's only a few hours left to traverse almost 10 miles of rainforest if he's to make the single daily ferry and get help. Everything was sore. I was bleeding, wounds all over the place. That was just hell. I felt more tired by the second, by the minute. vomiting. I sat uh, on my knees and uh, vomited. Straight away dawned on me to keep going and not to sit down and start thinking. There was still no time for that. 
The next task was to make it to where the ferry departs from. I saw the silhouettes of two people near the spot where you come onto the beach after you get dropped off by the ferry. And that gave me enough energy to actually make it. I had the feeling as though you, you see in Vietnam films when a veteran comes off the battlefield, all of a sudden it seemed so unreal to me what was happening that I thought, which authority is going to believe me? And how, how are they going to get a rescue party up here if, if I come along because they won't believe me? It's only a short distance from the beach to the ferry, where Geert's efforts are rewarded. The ferry has not yet departed. The ferry captain, from the very second that he saw my eyes, he knew that some serious thing had happened. Yeah, copy that. Uh, just stand by. Mate, um, the rescue services are on their way. Thank you. They want you to wait on the beach. I noticed spots on my right foot and knew that wasn't a good sign. The thought crossed my mind that I would lose that foot and I thought, don't even go there. You got enough on your plate to deal with right now. An hour passed. I looked to Martin Bowen and actually changed my position and, and went sit sideways so I could see it all the time. I just did not want to take my eyes off it anymore. The doctor was very calm, looked at me and he said, he gave me a very friendly nod, hi, uh, we would go up now and where do you think that we can find him? I asked Gert what position and what condition Warren had been in when he left. We had to make a guess that what we would take would be extrication equipment that is something adequate to lift the boulder off and perhaps uh, material to do an amputation if we couldn't get the boulder up. We weren't sure where we were going, uh, what we would find. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, actually it wasn't that good. I mean, really, it was not this morning. I mean, yesterday morning. Right about now, I've all but given up. You know, I'm convinced that something's happened to Geert and I'm basically just waiting to die. But the instant that I hear that helicopter, I I snapped to attention. That's where we went back. This is close. Yeah. Over here. Something major has just changed in that I'm no longer alone. Helicopter's still one of my favourite sounds. I can see his arm! I can see his arm! He's okay! We're going to take you back to the beach. We're going to drop you there, and we're going to come get him. Okay? Okay. Right. And I felt really happy and warm. All my tiredness was gone for a few minutes. <laughs> there is some kind of hope for me now. 
but I just felt so tired and so drained. I knew that I was nowhere near out of the danger zone yet. They dropped me off on the beach and I was asked to leave. I had to go and uh, had to wait for a second helicopter. I think we appreciated early on that because this is a very narrow ravine with trees hanging over it, there wasn't even a place to really bring the helicopter in and we were going to have to go down on wires. You know, even if you've had years of experience doing this, you don't approach a landing like that without fear and trepidation. Five mile an hour crosswind. All right, out, out and clear. Two meters to canopy. I was at the end. I was at the end of the rope. And I start to slip in and out of consciousness. One meter left. I had the clear impression he was dead when I approached him under the boulder. I thought that this is just a, a devastating injury. This is not survivable. So I was surprised when he responded to me at all. Man, am I glad to see you. And uh, you know, then, okay, then I knew. I knew we were there. I knew we were gonna be able to do something. How long you been here? I don't know. I'll... I don't know. Now, are you allergic to any drugs? Like anything you can give me. Now, we got some equipment to take the boulder off, but it's going to be a slow process. You, you just hang in there, OK? Now, you hold this. Keep it under your arm, OK? Right, that's it. Keep the pressure on, otherwise you'll be losing fluid. I would say for the normal mortal man, I would have expected him to die, honestly. If not fairly immediately, perhaps when we were to remove the boulder, there's a chance that toxins from the necrotic tissue, his legs would enter his circulation and just push him over the edge as far as acidosis and electrolyte imbalance is concerned quite the operation it took about two and a half hours for him to lift the rock off me he could have died at any moment i believe one two three four get off me get off me stay with me now breathe physically he survived the rescue attempt but you know from a physiologic point of view the guy's still in profound shock so his condition quite obviously was critical The helicopter rose and flew over Mount Bowen, and it was of a stunning beauty. I have, I, and I could really absorb the beauty, and I had that sense back. As they were wheeling me into the hospital, I, I knew that I was in incredibly bad shape and nowhere near out of the woods yet.
I call the hospital in Cairns and I get a nurse. Ah, oh, you get. Ah, oh, wow, wow, well, I'm glad he's he's fine, he's here. Would you like to speak to him? I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to speak to him. Pass on the phone. So I said, Warren, hi, how are you going? And he said, Yeah, I'm fine, you know. Ah, uh, I was a bit worried that you didn't make it out there, but you finally did it. Hey, thanks, mate, thanks. And then he said, but I lost my legs, mate. And, um, and I didn't even have, to have, have, to have to, the guts anymore, I think, to ask what, you know, what? what? I said, you lost your legs? Yeah, I lost my legs. And, uh, and I, I, I honestly cannot remember anymore what I said after that, but I, what I do remember is whacking the camera back through the window and getting really, really, really angry. And I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I'm sorry. I think the single biggest thing that helped me survive was that I had sort of spent a lifetime taking myself outside of my comfort zone. And that definitely helped me get through. And it's helped me deal with life the way that I have to deal with it now. For the rest of my life, I will be tied to the Hinchinbrook story and certainly to him. And I, I'm pretty proud and happy that I have got to know this very inspirational man. You have asked me five years ago, of course I'd rather be running around on two legs, but I think it's changed me so much and allowed me to see things so differently. If I had a chance to change it again, I, I don't necessarily know that I would. Warren now works as a motivational speaker and is the first above-the-knee amputee to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Geert returned permanently to Australia and now lives in Adelaide. He and Warren remain close friends.